Greetings, everyone. This is Richard Solomon. The show is Taking Care of Business. And this week, we are going to journey into the history of Whitestone with our guest, Jason Antos. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So, so like you, uh, we have a lot in common. I guess we're both in the field of journalism. You work with the Queen's Gazette. I'm on the radio. And we're both authors. Tell me about your book on Whitestone. Well, the book I wrote is uh, called Images of America, Whitestone. Uh, did it with Arcadia Publishing back in 2006. And I'm proud to say that it's the first uh, published history book uh, on the town. Wow. Now, I'm very excited because I, I, I am from Whitestone, and my parents and <laughs> grandparents moved to Whitestone, so we've been here a long, long time. Uh, I was telling you in pre-production, I remember when I was 10 years old, I want to give away my age here, but when I was 10 years old, on 16th Avenue, and I think it was 200th Street, there was a little plot of land that was, and this was only 1970, it wasn't that long ago, it was a little plot of land, it was a tomato farm, small, but it was a tomato farm, and I remember there was a horse there, and that was not that long ago. Wow. You know? So, there's a lot of trivia about Whitestone that people don't know. First of all, for those who are listening to us internationally, and there are a few of you out there, uh, Whitestone is in Northeast Queens that has a bridge that connects us to the Bronx, <laughs> whereby not too far from LaGuardia Airport, and uh, we're not too far from what was the World's Fair uh, from the 1930s and the 1960s. But, but Jason, let's, let's, let's kind of dive into what, what, what's sort of the dynamics of Whitestone today? What's, what's going on there? What, how big is it? And... Well, Whitestone's, uh, you know, like the rest of the city, the rest of the borough, it's constantly uh, expanding. Um, there's uh, property value is uh, pretty high in this area. Um, and they're always trying to develop more and more. And I think in uh, the next 10 years or so, we're going to see a little, little bit of a population boom. And because right now it's, uh, you know, the population of Whitestone is in the tens of thousands. Uh, and if you take into account all of uh, Flushing Village, which Whitestone and Bayside and Douglaston, et cetera, are a part of, I mean, you're talking about, you know, over 100,000 people. Right. So, so how, for, I, I read on, you know, Wikipedia uh, you know, Whitestone was sort of named after the limestone in the water. <laughs> what did you find out about the uh, the, well, the origins from the 17 and 1600s? It's interesting because that uh, boulder was actually there until the 60s. Um, it was a huge white limestone boulder that was, it was tremendous. Uh, when the first settlers came here, they saw the sun, ref the legend goes that they saw the sun reflecting off of it, and it was uh, like a beacon almost, and it was kind of beckoning them towards the land. And, you know, they were into all this, uh, all the omens and, you know, symbols and kind of thing, so they took it as a good omen, as a good symbol. And actually that rock was so white and reflective that when there was a full moon, sailors used to use that rock to mark the shoreline. Wow. And as the decades wore on and nature took its course and that rock began to turn green and, and black from, you know, from the water, from, I guess, algae and, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, chemical breakdown in the rock, um, it wasn't that visible in the moonlight. So it was at that point that the, all the sailors uh, petitioned the U.S. Coast Guard to build a lighthouse. So any famous photos that you see of the old Whitestone lighthouse was built right at the position where that rock was because it was so bright in the moonlight that it acted as its own like natural lighthouse. So, so did they build a lighthouse on it? Uh, it? They built it on the bluff right above it. So the rock was still there. Um, and it was so tremendous that people could climb on top of it and then sit on top of it. You could put about a dozen people on top of this boulder and sit them comfortably, and they would all have enough room. And uh, years later, that uh, rock became known as Hell's Bells because people would go on top of the rock and they would hang out and lose track of time for whatever reason, 
and the tide would come in, and there was no way for them to get back to shore. <laughs> so they called it Hell's Bells. Now, where is that rock right now? Uh, the rock is gone um, because in the 70s and 80s, as they expanded the shoreline uh, and filled it in, the rock uh, completely disintegrated and got you know swallowed up. So the, the exact position is known. Um, and the reason we, we thankfully know about the position is because of the old lighthouse that used to be there. And it would be in the part of Whitestone known as Whitestone Point. Which is which, where? Which is right by where the old CYO used to be. I know where that is. If oh, you, yeah. If I... you follow along the CYO property all the way to the end of the shoreline, there's like a point. It's, and you can tell that it's a point from where you're, from where you're standing. And right at that point, if you look down into the water, that's where the white stone would have sat. Now, now what's kind of cool about white stone is if you, on a beautiful summer day, if you take a drive to certain parts of white stone that you know, are, are on the water, the water's edge sort of, there are some spectacular views of the white stone bridge and the water. Um, it's just, it's really, really cool. Uh, and... Uh, it's sort of like you know, like the the, the Malva part or the I don't know the Criders Point parts, but there's some really interesting views uh, from Whitestone. Uh, who who are some of the more famous uh, personnel other than Jason Antos and Richard Solomon from <laughs> from Whitestone? <laughs> well, uh, we're the we're the more modern famous people, but who are the more the absolutely. historical famous people? Well, of course you have. I mean, they they can't compete with us, of course, you know, but. <laughs> Because um, we have radio and print media. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We're we're international. The um, it would be Francis Lewis, of course. Um, you know, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the town was called Clintonville for a short period of time, and we have a Clintonville Street, and that was after Dewitt Clinton, the uh, governor of New York, and uh, who I believe was the first governor of New York. And who was actually born in Maspeth. He was uh, born and raised in Maspeth and had property in Maspeth, and that's where his homestead was. Uh, but they named Whitestone in his honor because in those days uh, they would actually rename towns in honor of famous people, hoping that that person would be so impressed that they would like bestow some sort of uh, favoritism on the town. Uh, Astoria is a prime example. Yes, uh, they renamed they named it after John Jacob Astor, uh, hoping to impress him that he had a neighborhood named after him that he would pour all of his millions of dollars into the area to develop it, which he never did, and he never set foot in the area. He never even set foot in Astoria. So, and but just the name stuck. So Clintonville. Uh, Whitestone was renamed Clintonville kind of in the same, uh, you know, for the same purpose. And it was like that for about a year. And then once a post office was established, it reverted back to Whitestone. But you have, uh, as I said, you have uh, Francis Lewis, DeWitt Clinton, and then you have all the celebrities that lived here and people in entertainment business in the early 20s, early 30s. Just out of curiosity... I never use brands or anything like that on the radio, but is the White Rock Soda, did they kind of get the, the picture on their logo from White Stone, the White Stone, because they were kind of from White Stone originally? Yeah, I've, I've heard uh, conflicting stories that they were called that to begin with, and they, their presence here was kind of coincidence, and I've heard other you know, reports that they were somewhat inspired by the, by the town and the, the rock and, you know, they, they they named it White Rock. What was what was the local economy like way back when? But what did they do here? Uh, well, the, n- not much. Uh, <laughs> the uh, well, it was farming. I mean, that that's really what it was. It was just farming, and the industry was self-contained. It was just people would farm uh, to keep themselves alive, and, and that's what it was. It was just a place to live, and um, you know the. You know, anybody who had a career in those days, it was they were either a politician or an, atter- an attorney or a judge or something like that, and they would live out here. And 
uh, you know, their business was uh, basically owning property. I mean, that's what they did back in the 1700s and the early 1800s was they were landowners. I mean, that's how you made your living, just by buying land, buying land, and then selling it and letting people build on it. Uh, so the first uh, industry that uh, came to Whitestone was kind of a niche industry, was uh, right where the Wallbaum's uh, shopping center is, at the foot of Powell's Cove at 154th Street, a tremendous reserve of clay, a clay deposit, was discovered, along with a natural uh, spring. Oh, really? Wow. So the, uh, which was rich in iron. So the first industry here was the manufacturing of clay pipes. And that was uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, about the time that George Washington became the first president of the country. And then in the 1850s, about five or six years before the start of the Civil War, is when the first industry came to Whitestone. And that was with John Locke, who was a tinware manufacturer from Brooklyn. And he set up shop on 12th and Clintonville Street, and his warehouse is still there to this very day. Wow. And it's right across the street from the little Dunkin' Donuts that's on Clintonville and I believe 11th or 12th Avenue. And then, you know, directly across the street is this huge building uh, with a big roof, and that is the Locke factory. And he made tinware, um, he made uh, irons to iron clothes. Um, Japan wear, which I believe was a was like a form of China, it was like a form of uh, cooking wear in those days, and that was the main industry. He brought, uh, and it was a huge uh, facility, and he brought all of his employees from Brooklyn here to Whitestone and built homes for them. Because in those days, when you turned it into a factory town, you also housed the employees as well. Uh, kind of like what uh, Conrad Poppenhusen did in College Point when he made the rubber factories. So Whitestone became kind of like a company town in the 1850s and early 1860s because of John Locke. Now, what was the relationship between Whitestone and Bayside? The uh, relationship between Whitestone and Bayside... Or, or the difference, you know, the relative difference, because I know that in Bayside you had Fort Totten. And at the time, I guess they were building the fort, and they were building the historical Civil War era fort, which I actually, <laughs> you know, now that the statute of limitations have probably passed. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to crawl all over the the, uh, the the fort, which was never really concluded as far as its construction. But what's kind of interesting is there is a fortress that actually faces the bay, and it faces Fort Schuyler on the other side. And it was made out of really, really big, you know, I guess, granite-type stones. I'm not sure how it was made or where it was made, but um, it was actually very, very interesting. When I was a kid growing up, a lot of children had officers as parents stationed at Fort Totten. And then one of the things everybody used to do was, like, used to kind of break into the old fort and, wow. <laughs> and just <laughs> and play. And, in fact, a lot of the kids knew all the, the really cool places to go. And they'd show you, and you'd see what would be the places where, I guess, the cannons would point. But I, I know that it was never really finished in terms of construction. But what was, was there a rivalry? Was there a, a, a symbiotic relationship or anything like that? Um, not, not really. I mean, the towns were kind of independent uh, on their own um, because before the consolidation of New York City in 1898, uh, towns in, in Queens, <coughs> excuse me, and in Brooklyn, and around the five boroughs were pretty much like towns that you would find in Long Island. Um, for example, towns in Long Island, even though, let's say, they all might be part of Nassau County or might be part of Suffolk County, each town has its own fire department, its own police department, and Bayside and Whitestone were exactly like that. They had their own fire departments, their own... Um, their own police departments, their own kind of little form of city government. And uh, it was kind of just territorial. You know, you know, when you started seeing names like Bell and uh, Abraham Bell and all those people and Isaac Bell, you knew that you were in Bayside. And when you started seeing names like Powell 
and uh, Fish and Hicks and all that type of property name, you knew that you were getting close to Whitestone. So it was really, uh, there, there wasn't pretty much of a rivalry. They were kind of just independent and, you know, in their own way. I'll leave you this. When I was a kid, I thought the Bell Boulevard was named after Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> right. And, and a, lot, a lot of people do. And also, I believe, is, there's an Alexander Graham Bell High School, right? Or I, middle school? I don't know, but I can tell you this. On Somewhere on 32nd Avenue in one of the cross streets, I guess sort of by the Bayside Milk Farm, Okay. you actually see uh, like a, a post that says Bell Avenue, but it looks like it's old. But we'll have to continue our conversation about Whitestone with Jason Antos, uh, author, historian, and reporter, uh, right back after this. We'll be right back. Keep it locked in at TCB Radio. Welcome back. Richard Solomon, TCB Radio, taking care of business. I'm flying solo today. My guest is local historian, local resident, uh, reporter, journalist, um, Jason Antos, whose book is Images of America, Whitestone by Arcadia Press. And I've seen the book. It's a, it's a great, great book. And it's near and dear to me because uh, I'm from Whitestone. And uh, a lot of my family has lived in Whitestone. And uh, it's just kind of cool to know all the little nooks and crannies. So one of the things that we were talking about in pre-production, which, which we should share with our audience here, is that Whitestone actually had a railroad at some point. What, what was that like and why is it not here anymore? <laughs> that is a question asked by many people, including myself. Um, I, you know, the story of the railroad is uh, awesome and tragic at the same time. Uh, Whitestone, uh, as we became more developed in the late 1860s, once we became a factory town and uh, population started to expand, uh, we needed a railroad. And it was actually John Locke and Conrad Poppenhusen from College Point who got together and said, "Listen, we need. You know, we're building this factory town. Uh, you know, there's no reason why we can't expand it." to be beyond the factory town, to be a big residential area because there's so much property and so much land here. So we need to bring a railroad out here for people who are interested in buying property, for people who are interested in buying our products, to ship our products. We really need a railroad. So in 1869, or 1868 rather, uh, they created what was known as the Flushing Northside Railroad. And that railroad, uh, you know, it, there's a long, long history and complicated uh, political circumstance of what happened. I don't want to, you know, put anybody to sleep. But eventually, a few years later, it was absorbed by the Long Island Railroad. And the uh, Long Island Railroad brought the line here to Whitestone. And we had a railroad here from 1869, all, which is the year that professional baseball started, by the way all the way up until 1932. And then what happened? And then the Great Depression happened, and the, the LIRR basically pulled the same stunt that the MTA does today when they want to eliminate a bus route, uh, is they claim low ridership, and that it's not turning a profit. And there is documented uh, proof to show that the Whitestone branch of the LIRR was operating at some kind of a loss uh, in the last few years of its, of its, of its existence. Um, but the, the tragic part was, the ironic part was, it was really the LIRR's fault why it was operating at a loss. There was a lot more that they could have done to turn that around. It was a very simple resolution. But and also, the town depended greatly on the railroad. Uh, in fact, when the railroad was eliminated, people actually moved from Whitestone. And people also sued the LIRR because since the railroad was going to be eliminated, their property value decreased tremendously overnight. 
and businesses had, uh, they sold their businesses. People went out of business because there was no railroad here. So the loss of the railroad was devastating. Um, you know, anybody in Whitestone in the Beechhurst area could hop on a train, and within less than 25 minutes, they, they would be in Penn Station. I mean, that's just, like, unfathomable to think today, but that, that was reality for many years. You would just mosey on down to where the Wallbaum Shopping Center is today by 154th, or you would go to the other station, which was on the Cross Island Parkway, um, just about 100 feet away from the 150th Street overpass, and hop the train there. It would take you to Malta, Cal- uh, College Point, Flushing, and then straight on into the city. No, nope. and go ahead, go ahead. you know there were there were trains every every forty five minutes. Now, are there any artifacts left of this railroad, either in the transit museum or anywhere in private collections, or or, the, is, it, um, or is it just completely gone? The only thing that um, exists from the railroad are photographs. Um, I actually am the owner of about a dozen original photographs, and by originals I mean I am the owner of the glass plate negatives that were created back when they were taken in 1912. Um, So it's things like this. Uh, The Transit Museum has a ton of uh, negatives from the train station, and really that's it. It's just these negatives and photos and uh, maps. Uh, that were written by uh, railroad enthusiasts back in the 50s and 40s that literally document every square inch of the rail line and the right-of-way and where it dipped and curved and crossed. And But that's it. There's, there's really no physical uh, remnants. The only th- uh, thing that you can argue is that uh, there is still the right-of-way um, that cuts through Whitestone, the right of way. This would be the pathway of the train. Right. And certain homes that are built along 154th Street that were built after the railroad or while the railroad was here, you know, towards the end of its existence, the homes are catty cornered. They're they're curved to the side. They're not built directly uh, perpendicular to the street. They're built at an angle, and that's to let the train pass pass by. Oh, wow. What was the fare back then? Uh, the fare was, uh, you know, started at 15 cents, and then it grew to a quarter, then it grew to uh, 60 cents, and then 75 cents. And then I think uh, in 32, when the railroad ended, it was almost a dollar. Now, that must have been big money back then. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was kind of a luxury uh, to, to take the railroad. Um, it wasn't the same as taking, uh, you know, the MTA or the IRT, the Interval Rapid Transit. I mean, you're taking the LIRR, which is a private railroad, and, um, you know, the line, and they, they kind of, I think, juiced up the price in terms of the North Shore lines because, like I said, they were operating at a loss, so maybe they tried to cover their losses by doing these, like, uh, fair hikes and whatnot, which, you know, I'm sure, you know, they still do today, of course, uh, as we know with the bridges and tunnels, with the fares and, you know, the tolls and everything, but that's, uh, people, people were happy to spend it, you know, everybody, I have met a lot of people doing the book talks uh, since Whitestone was published, and I have actually met people who remember taking the railroad. Oh, wow. As kids, you know, I met, uh, you know, two people, they were in their late 90s, and they, you know, they were like 12 or 13 when, when the railroad was here and just talking about uh, everything with them. And, and uh, you know, it, it might have been a little bit pricey towards the end, but it was a tremendous, tremendous source of convenience. You know, there were actually people in Whitestone who didn't even own a car because wow. they lived right by the railroad. And when the railroad left, they had to, they had to buy a car. <laughs> they were like, oh, we have to go buy a car now. I don't believe this because there was no bus service. There was no trolley service. There hadn't been trolley service in the neighborhood in, in, in years. So the railroad's gone. So how the, how the heck do you get around? And then that's, that's why we have bus service here in Whitestone, because the city, excuse me, the town protested and petitioned the city that, listen, you gotta, you got to provide bus service. You know, Whitestone is a pretty isolated area. You know, and if you cut off this railroad, 
um, you know, we're going to be in, in pretty dire straits. And people thought that they were bluffing. You know, people in the town really never thought that they would actually go ahead and cut off the railroad, but they did. Yeah. And uh, people protested right into the end. I mean, they had massive, massive protests with signs and torches and everything that you can imagine in, in down 150th Street in front of the train stations, uh, you know, for, for weeks up until the very end. Where, where was the main station? Where, like, in other words, what part of Whitestone today comprises what was the station? Uh, well, the, fir- the first station... Or the main station. Yeah. ...would be uh, where the wall bounds is. Okay. By uh, Tropicana? And Tropicana. In yeah. fact, uh, the shop houses that Tropicana occupies are the shop houses built by the Long Island Railroad back in the early 1900s. Uh, Tropicana was basically the rail yard where they would do repairs and maintenance on the equipment and on the rolling stock. And then where Cascarino's is today, that's where the wooden one-story train station was. Oh, wow. For what was known as the Whitestone Landing Station, because before this area was called Beechurst, it was called Whitestone Landing. Now, how many many station stops were in the Whitestone area? Uh, there were only two. Uh, I, I could tell you right now, I'll just go over brief, briefly the route. Uh, so if you got on, on the train in those days, you would walk down into the Wallbound Shopping Center, and the parking lot uh, would pretty much be a parking lot back then. It was a place where the horses would gather, and then in those days the early Model Ts would gather to pick up and drop off passengers. And you would walk up to where Cascarino's is, and that's where the wooden station was. You would step over the tracks up onto the platform. The train would come down from Tropicana, and you'd board the train, and then he would depart, and he would cross over 10th Avenue uh, where there was a gate, you know, a crossing gate, and the train would run parallel to 154th Street. He'd cut through the PS193 playground. He would cut in back of Tony's uh, Beekshire's Deli. Um, I know where all these places are. (laughs) And go all the way up to 14th Avenue, uh, right in back of the rear of the Whitestone Shopping Center, you know that big ramp? Sure. Uh, the reason that that ramp is there, that huge incline, that's all landfill. That part of 14th Avenue that crosses in back of the shopping center was actually a bridge. It was not a road. It was a bridge, overpass, and the train would pass underneath 14th Avenue, pass alongside the Whitestone Shopping Center, which, which was in those days a big hill, just and it would pass alongside this hill, cut through where the Whitestone Library is at Clintonville and 14th. And then Clintonville itself, which was known as 11th Avenue in those days, was also a bridge. And they would pass under Clintonville Street and then merge onto what is now the pathway of the Cross Island Parkway, where it would come to stop at the second station, the Whitestone Station. And this was directly across the street from Verdi's. Oh, so I know. Yeah if, yeah. if you walk out of Verdi's today, let's say you walk straight out and you look directly ahead of you, you're going to see the guardrail, you know, alongside the service road. Right. And that guardrail, right in that that space, is where the three story station house was. And then the train would leave from there and continue towards Malva, pretty much following the Cross Island Parkway today, as you would if you got on from. Uh, let's say by you know the shopping center, and you were heading towards the Whitestone Bridge, and it would pr- pretty much head along that same path, and then it would head into Malva to 149th Street and Malva Drive, where the third station was. And then he would go due west to College Point to I believe 126th Street and 18th Avenue. Um, to the College Point Station, and then from that point on, the train would go through like a no-man's land. It would go through where the um, the Target is. It would cross 20th Avenue. It would go through where the DMV is and the old Flushing Airport, and it would just cut through all of this, what was then marshland. It was just all marsh and salt meadow and swamp, and it would go over what is now the Wysone Expressway, 
and cut into the Pathmark Shopping Center, which is by the Whitestone Bowling Alley. I know where all of that is. Oh, Whitestone Bowling Alley open 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, and it would go straight past that bowling alley, and it would come down a little corridor and stop right at Northern Boulevard. Uh, and and um, Northern Boulevard, just a few feet away from College Point Boulevard. Uh, it would be, if, if you remember the old RKO Keiths. Sure do. It, it would be around 100 feet down from the Keiths towards College Point Boulevard. All right? I think I saw Star Wars there. And my mother saw it there, too. <laughs> uh, in fact, there's rem- uh, uh, if you are on that part of Northern Boulevard heading towards College Point Boulevard, there's a Blackman's Plumbing and Hardware Supply Store. Right. And that building was part of the train station. Oh really? Yeah, it was. Um, it was actually a refrigeration shed uh, that can that uh, preserved meat, and they would put the meat on the train, and the uh, the platform was connected to that building. So right where the Blackman's plumbing supply is is where the train would pull up. Then the train would cross Northern Boulevard, cross. Well, there wasn't that big bridge that's there today. That that was further down, and it would cross over College Point Boulevard and come right in front of the U-Haul building, which at that time was the W.J. Sloan Furniture Warehouse and then later became Serval Zipper Factory, cross over the creek, and then merge into what is now the, the City line? Field Willits Point Station of the Port Washington line. Oh, the Port, okay. And then, and then basically take that exact line, that same trackage, and go all the way into Manhattan. And in fact, the next time you go to City Field on the Long Island Railroad, you get off on the platform, and all you have to do is walk down to the end of the platform heading back towards uh, downtown Flushing right? so that you see downtown in the distance. And when you get to the edge of the platform where you can't walk anymore, look down into the marsh, into the swamp, and you see the old tracks of the Whitestone Branch still sticking out. Wow, that, that actually is the, or I guess that's a cool artifact. Uh, I'll tell you, what you talked about in that last segment really brought up a lot of interesting uh, things to talk about. Did you know, when you talk about Flushing Airport, Many, many years ago, the Goodyear blimp used to land there. Oh, yeah. And I remember when the blimp would come and, and would land there. And I remember when it was, a, like, when it was an active airport. Um, so that was kind of interesting. I know that uh, one of my clients, a really good friend of mine, told me that in the Civil War era, that in, I guess, on Clintonville Street by sort of uh, junior high school 194 in that area, where I guess Clint, uh, Kent Cleaners was, Okay. It was a place that they they made caskets that were used in the Civil War. Wow! So that was that was some. I, I don't have any anything other than my good friends, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, trivia uh, for that. Um, but but you know, there's some amazing things. Why why is there not, or why has no one proposed until I guess just now? Why aren't there plaques? all over Whitestone that says, hey, on this site in you know, the 1700s was this, or this is where the Whitestone Railroad was, or this, this, this site comprised the, you know, the Whitestone Station, or something like that. It'd be kind of cool to see all that stuff uh, all over the place, because it seems like there's a lot of really cool history that's sort of just being sort of you know, neglected by modernization and you know, development. Absolutely. You know, and and I, get, I get asked that question often. Um, and there really hasn't been any major movement to put those plaques. Uh, and I think it's for one of two reasons. One, there were two plaques at one time in Whitestone, one of them marking the site of the Francis Lewis farm, and another one marking the site of the Samuel Leggett Church, what was known as the White Rock Church, across from St. Luke's, where Walt Whitman taught. And uh, those two signs were vandalized. And they cost a lot of money to produce, because I think they're made out of, like, cast iron or something. They're, they're very heavy. They're huge. And, um, uh, you know, and there's just a lot of political red tape that you need to go through, and I guess people just don't think it's worth the effort, you know? Well, all I can say is I did, I did a show for Memphis, and one of the parts of the show that I did was I literally walked through Memphis and read into a handheld recorder, all of the signs 
that were just there on the street. And it was amazing what was on all these different spots. And it was, it was a cool show. I'd love to do Walking Through Whitestone and, and talk about all of that stuff. And, and they're, all, they're all over Long Island. They're all over Long Island, that's on Suffolk. They're all over upstate. You know, and it's and it's everything from like you know the major historical point to like the banal. It's just like you know, you know, here stood an old uh, you know barn. You know, that was the oldest right. barn in the northern hemisphere. Something you know, very like random like that. But then it'll be something like okay, well, this is where there was a Revolutionary War battle fought. You know, etc. But they're all over the place, but not but not here in Queens. All right, when when, I, when we come back because this show is flying, uh, I want to know. Was there a Native American population here? And second, is there any archaeology around here? But we'll ask those questions on the other side of this break. We'll be right back. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business, tcbradio.com. And on YouTube, tcbradio.com, user forward slash tcbradio, WCWP. We'll be right back. back this is richard solomon taking care of business thanks for listening our show is about whitestone and our guest is jason antos historian author journalist and whitestone resident so i asked before the break a a quick question which was was there a native american population here and the other thing is there any archaeology around here or has, has there been any attempts at archaeology well absolutely there have been um many attempts over the years uh, for archaeological digs. In fact, there was one that took place in College Point just last year um, where one of the properties that belonged to Poppenhusen's American uh, hard rubber company was being demolished. And before anybody could build on it, it's actually a law that if it is a site that is old or historic, that uh, an archaeologist has to come in for just a few days before they start, you know, digging or laying a foundation to see what's down there. And they uncovered um, uh, glass bottles from pharmacies, from local pharmacies that were there in College Point about 150 years ago, and a lot of discarded rubber products like uh, rubber combs, buttons, etc., that were made by Poppenhusen's uh, Hard American Rubber Company. Wow. Yeah, a good friend of mine, I won't mention his full name, but Vinny collects uh, antique bottles, and he has a lot of local things uh, from around here. Uh, is there a place where some of these artifacts can actually be found? Um, in terms of like a museum? Or, yeah. Uh, well, there is actually a standing exhibit at the Bayside Historical Society, we have uh, an archaeological room where we have uh, artifacts that are from a dig that was conducted right on the Fort Totten property many, many years ago. And things that were found were just incredible. Uh, you know, we found uh, teeth. Uh, I believe they found many arrowheads. They found some jewelry uh, that was ancient. Uh, and a lot of Native American uh, artifacts. I believe that there was a pot or a clay pot that was found and things of that nature. So, yeah, there's, there's always a ton of stuff that's uh, buried under the ground here. So was there a Native American population here at some point? There was. Uh, it was the Matinecock. Uh The Matinecock were a division of the Algonquin Nation. Um, years ago, up, up until recently, uh, anybody in the public school system or Long Island that learned about the Native Americans, they would learn about the so-called 13 tribes of Long Island. Uh, now that we know a lot more about Native Americans and appreciate Native Americans in a different way that we did years ago, uh, we realized that uh, there was no such thing as 13 tribes of Long Island. Um, the... Uh, Native American names like uh, Ronkonkoma or Massapequa or things like this, they're not the names of the natives. They're the names that the natives apply to the area. They're geographical descriptions of the area. So Matinecock, which was used to believe was, 
you know, because of the Matinecock Indians, it was actually the Algonquins calling the area Matinecock, which means the place of the of the large hills or rolling hills. Well, I didn't know they had rolling hills back here because it's kind of flat. And they, well, there there is if you if you've ever gone up Tenth Avenue towards 150th Street. Um, you go yeah. up a huge incline. You, you know, I never thought about that, but yeah, I never and, thought about that. Yeah. And if you go toward, and a lot of the hills, believe it or not, were right where the approach is to the Whitestone Bridge. In fact, the Powell family from Powell's Cove lived on this tremendous, tremendous hill, which at the time was the highest elevation in the borough of Queens. And it was called Cookie Hill. And the name of and the town of Whitestone was actually called Cookie Hill for a short period of time. Uh, so that gives you and but a lot of these hills had been either demoed to make way for expressways and bridges, or there's so much development on them you don't really appreciate how big the hill actually is. Um, so that's where Matinica comes from. Another example would be. Uh, the uh, Mazpeth, uh, which is named after the Mashpeta uh, uh, division of the Algonquin. Uh, they called the place Mashpeta, which means the place of dirty or filthy water. <laughs> so you'd basically have two groups meet on a road on a, on a Native American foot trail, and one would say to the other, well, who are you? And they would say, we're the Matinecock, meaning we're the, we come from the place of the rolling hills. Where are you from? And the other would respond, well, we, we come from the place of the dirty, stagnant water. And they go, oh, yeah, 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 we, we know where that is. Yeah, we, we try to stay away from that. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, that's how it was. They, they would identify themselves with the geographic location uh, that they were originating from. Now, would they, are there descendants of these people local today? They're still around? Oh, yes. Uh, the, there's a Matinecock tribe at way, way out east um, towards, uh, I believe, Montauk. And, um, but that's not the Shinnecock. That's different. Yeah, it's different from the Shinnecock. Uh, it's the Matinecock, and they, I believe their leader is um, Chief Little Fox, if I'm not mistaken. But there's a lot of uh, fractions amongst the Matinecock. So there's like all these different subgroups, but on a local level, uh, there is a Native American community right here in Little Neck. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to find out more about that. Where, where are they centralized? Or <laughs> how do you find them? They are living in a two-house compound in back of what was the Scobie Diner. Oh, nice. um, living in a house that their family has lived in for over 130 years in two farmhouses that literally saw the building of Northern Boulevard, Little Neck Parkway, the Long Island Expressway, and everything around it. Um, In fact, uh, in the original survey, uh, they were the only two homes in the entire section of that area, which is the crossroad, I guess, of Northern and, and Little Neck Parkway. And uh, right by uh, a few blocks down from uh, from the SCOBY is the stop and shop and the post office. Yeah. Uh, well, right there was the huge native, uh, was the huge Matinecock burial ground. And the burial ground was there up until 1938 when, in anticipation for the First World Fair, the city widened all major road arteries heading into the city to accommodate traffic, and Northern Boulevard was widened. And in order to widen it, they had to eliminate the cemetery. So the Matinecock were all dug up, and and the cemetery was very evident. There were tombstones still there. It was gated off, and the city dug up the tombstones, dug up the bodies, and you know Native Americans, like all ancient cultures, when when they're buried, uh, they're buried with you know their belongings, with the certain artifacts that meant something to them, and they would. The belief was that they would take it to the afterlife. So the city dug up all of these artifacts as well, 
and half of the artifacts went to various uh, Native American museums across the country, which the family was completely devastated over because you're not supposed to do that. It has to stay with the person at all time. And the bodies were all, which were in individual graves, and they were clearly marked and clearly labeled, were all dug up, put in one containment unit, and then put in a mass grave at the, in the churchyard at the Zion Cemetery, which is on Douglaston Parkway and Northern Boulevard. And they stuck a huge uh, granite boulder on top of them. And it says, here lie the last of the Matinecock. That's a little brutal. And wow. uh, the family that lives at Little Neck Parkway in Northern Boulevard, uh, since the 30s, they're from, starting from their great-grandparents all the way up till now, uh, have been fighting for the restoration of that cemetery and have also been fighting for the return of these uh, artifacts. And they uh, were actually able to track down some of the artifacts removed, and they are in some very prominent museums in this country, and the museums refuse to give these pieces up from their collection. Well, wow, and none of this makes the news. <laughs> no, no, it's it's really you gotta. It's something that you find out by accident, and then you then you discover that they've been, you know, complaining all these years, but nobody listens to them. They they just simply don't listen to them. You know, they they write them off as crazy and or stupid, whatever, or I don't know what. And uh, but then once you start listening, and then they show you all this documentation, then you do your own research. And it all, uh, it's all true, you know, it's all, uh, you know, you're able to verify everything that, the, that they're told. And, you know, the, the removal of the cemetery is a very well uh, photographically documented event and written about in the Times and in all the local papers. And I actually um, have the original affidavit uh, served by the city uh, to order the removal of the burial ground. And the explicit directions mentioned inside uh, that stipulate that none of the uh, artifacts or the trinkets or belongings are to be separated from the bodies and put elsewhere, that they're supposed to all go together to the uh, alternate burial site. Why, why did they pick that particular burial site as opposed to maybe something closer to Montauk that would be more... Uh, I guess spiritually appropriate. Uh, I, I don't. I don't really know, and I don't even think they know. Um, you know, because it's it's totally inappropriate. I mean, it's at the mounds. You know, it's not. Uh, you know, it's in a uh, cemetery that's not even, I believe, of, of their faith or whatever that they. You know, the more modern day Matenikok were practicing, and you know, it has nothing to do any connection to their history. I think you know that Mount Zion was nice enough to take in the remains, but it's just that, you know, it added, a lot, it added a lot of fuel to the fire. Wow. And uh, just on a final note, um, the reason that that cemetery was there to begin with was because it was at that section where the Matinecock had their last stand against the white settlers in the mid-1800s. Wow, that that's a whole radio show right there. Uh, yeah, is there is there is there a place where you can learn more about the Matinecock? Oh, absolutely. You can um, if you go on Amazon and uh, buy the movie called uh, uh, Lost. I believe it's Lost Souls or Lost Spirits, but I'm ninety five percent sure it's Lost Souls, and it's a doc. It's a an hour and a half documentary made by the, uh, I believe, the great nephew or the grandson of this Matinecock family that lives in Back of Scobie. And he did this beautiful hour and a half of uh, documentary about the burial ground and about the history of the natives in, in eastern Queens. And that, that really gives you a good idea of uh, what the whole story is about. I was trying to check here. Uh, hold on. Uh, or I, I believe it's called Lost Spirits or something like maybe, that. Maybe it's Lost Spirits. It is. I, I don't know. We'll have to. We'll have to. In, we'll post something on the YouTube site uh, to accompany yeah. this this section or this part of the, the yeah, recording. Yeah, we, we really should get. I really should find out what the. So 
So let's do like this. There's only uh, four minutes left in this particular segment of FM broadcast. We'll have to spill over to a YouTube segment. But in the lightning round, uh, what can you tell us about Fort Totten? I know that when I was a kid, my parents told me that the uh, Golden Knights paratroopers were here and Nike missiles, which were nuclear missiles, were based here. And that was like sort of a well-known fact. That just everybody kind of knew that. Yeah, I believe that the... um uh, it was becoming a Nike missile base, and um, there were obviously tremendous protests. And the missiles, I believe uh, somebody had told me that they were actually lined up down Bell Boulevard at the entrance to the fort. And at the last minute, they, the trucks turned around wow. with, the, with the payload on their flatbeds. I mean, kind of... <laughs> Really, really quirky moment in history. Um, you know, before Totten, you know, it was a Civil War era fort. Um, it was uh, that area is the original Willits Point. When we hear about Willits Point, we always think of the factories, uh, the factories, the body shops, and the uh, auto body repair places across from City Field. But that is actually the original Willits Point, and it was the home of Charles Willett and his family. And the Willits farmhouse is still there. It's completely dilapidated, but it's right next to the officers' quarters, uh, which is now Bayside Historical Society's headquarters. And uh, Charles Willits is uh, buried about uh, 200 feet uh, north of the main entrance to the fort. You can see his tombstone underneath a big uh, maple tree. And uh, the fort... uh, was active all the way, I believe, until the mid-90s. Uh, it was a huge training ground uh, for soldiers going into World War I. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it, it definitely has a, a huge uh, military history. Wow. Wow. This was like a very fast hour of radio, so we're going to wrap the FM part of it now with some contact information and other things. Sure. And then we're going to spill into for those who want more uh we're going to go straight to uh, add this on to the youtube component uh but real fast uh your book can be found on amazon and uh, can be found on amazon barnes and noble barnes and noble the bay terra shopping center absolutely there you go it's not, nothing like local <laughs> they, they, they even sell it at the barnes and noble near madison square garden which is quite quite impressive but, uh, yeah, you can find it in most Barnes & Nobles and, of course, definitely on Amazon. And if people want to read your columns or send you an email, is there a contact? Oh, sure. Um, the newspaper that I write for and that I'm the editor for is the Queen's Gazette in Long Island City. Uh, the website, we are a weekly newspaper, uh, free to pick up on the streets, but paid subscription. Uh, so if you can't find a hard copy, you can read the online edition which is, uh, has more information probably than the actual paper does, than the actual print edition. Uh, you can access that by going to Q, just the letter Q, Gazette, G-A-Z-E-T-T-E dot com. QGazette.com. And if people want to send you a direct email? Uh, they can send it to Jason Antos, J-A-S-O-N-A-N-T-O-S, jasonantos at aol.com alright cool well I appreciate being part of this FM broadcast I appreciate if you could stick around for our special YouTube component this is Richard Solomon thanks for listening we'll see you next week uh, if you missed this you gotta catch us on YouTube this was Jason Antos we're talking about the history of Whitestone and his book Images of America Whitestone by Arcadia Press thanks for listening see you next week but if you're on YouTube stick with us all right, for those out there, we'll be seeing you. What I really need Some kind of affection All right, hey, YouTube fans, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we, we couldn't pack it all in on the FM broadcast, so we're, we're putting some more on the... Uh, on the recording here because the topic was so cool. We're with Jason Antos. We're talking about the history of Whitestone. And we're just going to really try to fl- fly through a lot of topics. So first question, Jason, who, who are some of the famous people who like lived here? You know, uh, I, I, I remember people telling me that, that W.C. Fields lived here. 
Sure. Uh, W.C. Fields uh, used to swim in Whitestone, but he had his home in Bayside, uh, in Bayside Heights, closer to the Cross Island Parkway. Uh, W.C. Fields lived here, lived in Bayside for many years, and actually filmed one of his most famous uh, feature-length films uh, exclusively in Bayside. Oh, what was that? It's, it's a movie called Sally of the Sawdust with uh, Mary Pickford, and you can uh, buy it on DVD through Amazon, uh, where it's widely available. And the entire movie is, sh- is shot uh, in Bayside. Uh, all of the exteriors uh, take place uh, on these beautiful fields and farmlands, and, and then you realize that it's the Bay Terra Shopping Center, where it would be built uh, <laughs> 60 years, 70 years later. And towards the climax of the film, uh, there's this whole Keystone Cop-like chase down Bell Boulevard, and as he's running, you see the dirt, the poofs of dirt uh, billow up behind him as he's running, because uh, you have to realize that the, the road is made out of dirt, and it's not, there's not uh, even asphalt, and it's kind of, it's it's a cool film, because it's, it's like a, um, uh, it almost becomes like a documentary in a way, you know? Maybe they should, you know, in the movies in the park at uh, Fort Totten, maybe they should show that movie uh, for, you know, historical purposes. I know. Oh, what, I'm, what, I'm actually working on that right now. I'm trying to have a big screening done uh, at Bayside Historical uh, for one of our event nights and trying to get someone who plays piano to come in and do the piano accompaniment to the to the movie. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> we have like a silent movie night and... You know, and when it gets to the certain scenes that show like a part of Bayside, we freeze frame it and then like describe to the audience what they're what they're looking at. And there's even a scene in the movie where uh, W.C. Fields takes refuge inside of the old cigar factory that was on Bell Boulevard, um, and it was the White Owl Cigar Factory, and it was the first White Owl Cigar Factory in the country. That is fascinating. Um- Rudolph Valentino, when I was a kid yeah. growing up, uh, right by the Clearview Golf Course, there was an old house. It was always rumored that it was Rudolph Valentino's house, or a summer house, rather. And there was an old car. It was a really old car, like a 1940s kind of Chevy Ford. Uh, I remember this growing up, always in the driveway. And then, of course, then it became renovated and different looking and a restaurant uh, or successive restaurants. What could you tell me about that property and, and Rudolph Valentino being there? Uh, Valentina was there for a short time, um, and uh, a lot of these guys, when they built these homes, they, they wouldn't stay there. They would only stay there if their work brought them to the area, and they would just let let them out to all of their friends and colleagues uh, if they needed a place to stay. And I believe that after Valentino died, the house and the property went to uh, Fiorello LaGuardia, who used it as uh, his uh, summer home. That's pretty significant. I wonder who the people were that lived there in the, like in the 70s, uh, the 60s and 70s. Because somebody lived there, uh, it was obvious, but I'll have to ask some of the local folk. Uh, now, in pre-production, you told me that Whitestone was famous because some famous, music- uh, fam- famous magicians mm-hmm. uh, had contacts here, including uh, Houdini. Tell me about... Uh, Thurston and, and all the other greats that uh, were, were, were here and what years they were here. Sure. Well, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, Beechurst, um, which, uh, as I mentioned before, was formerly Whitestone Landing, it became Beechurst in 1906 from the Shore Acres Realty Company. Um, uh, and in that area lived a magician by the name of the great Hermann. And Herman lived in an old Victorian mansion that predated the creation of Beechers by decades. And this Victorian mansion was on top of a tremendous hill, a huge mound. And um, that hill, the top of that mound next to the mansion, was actually the location of a revolutionary era fort that was there uh, simultaneously next to the house. Uh, This hill has been leveled since and is now the location of the Beechurst Towers, the apartment building. Sure. 
okay? But that all that property that the towers uh, occupy um, was the homestead for Herman, and he was the greatest uh, magician of his time, and he was uh, kind of a bit of an eccentric. He lived alone. Uh, just to show you the type of guy that he was, uh, he rigged this uh, device that whenever you would ring his doorbell, a little uh, trap door would open just above the doorbell where you had your finger pushed in, and the crow would stick its beak out and peck at you <laughs> uh, and scare the living you-know-what out of people. Um, and around this time, he gets a letter from a young admirer of his saying that, you know, he owes everything to him and, uh, you know, he's going to work his whole life at trying to perfect uh, the magic that Herman created. And he's also going to have his own career, blah, blah, blah. And this was a magician by the name of Howard Thurston. And uh, he went to Beecher's to meet Herman, and they became very, very good friends. And Herman decided to take the young um, apprentice under his wing and Thurston moved in a home, actually constructed a home right across the street from Herman. Uh, so you had Herman and um, uh, Thurston living here at the same time. Then Herman, who was much older, he passed away. His property was sold off, and that hill leveled, and within a year or so, of the Beecher's Towers were erected. And um, Thurston lived here in Whitestone for almost a decade. He really, really liked the area. And um, uh, Thurston, uh, let's see, I think, he, I think he lived here until the time that his wife died, and he had kind of a nervous breakdown. Uh, but before all this happened, he got a letter from a young up-and-coming magician by the name of Houdini. Um, and Houdini came out to Beecher's to meet Thurston, and they ended up hitting it off and started working on magic acts and whole shows together where they would uh, appear together. You know, the great Thurston with uh, the young Houdini, the young apprentice, so on and so forth. And that's, um, yeah, wow. that's, uh, that's Whitestone's uh, connection to the, the magic industry. Wow, that's, that's, that's fast. I used to, as a kid, I was a magician. The, the place to go to was a place called Lou Tannins, and you'd go to Broadway and... What you do is you'd see people do magic tricks, and then if you really liked it, uh, you would buy it, and they'd show you how to do it. Oh, and that's I, awesome. when I was a kid, I you know I actually did like little kid shows, <laughs> things like that. It was actually pretty cool. But that was a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away. Um, what do you know of anything about what uh, GTE Sylvania Labs was like around here? Because um, I understand there was a there was like a, a nuclear accident here, uh, in, like in the 1950s. Yeah, I I first learned about that when I was doing research at the Long Island Division at the Queens Public Library, which uh, is an archive open to the public seven days a week. Uh, you don't even need a, an appointment to go there. But nonetheless, uh, I was doing research there, and I came across all of these press photos uh, concerning this uh, uh, nuclear nightmare in Whitestone. And it was a, drew a, drew a lot of attention from area politicians and stuff like that. But uh, reading into the uh, articles, I found it, it was supposed supposedly contained. Supposedly, but yeah. <laughs> so supposedly, yeah. If we if we start glowing green or we grow a, a third eyeball, then we know that that wasn't true. You know, The Simpsons did an episode about that. Uh, it was like about Blinky, the three-eyed fish, and yeah. Um, they said, you know, nuclear energy are a misunderstood friend, and then I think they swept something under the car- carpet and said, oh, we'll just worry about this in 20,000 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, let, let it decay first. Um, what, other, what other fascinating uh, history is around here? Homes, artifacts, people, movies, incidents? Um, well, well Wystone, you know, was home to many different types of industry over the years. Uh, in fact, uh, because of the huge uh, presence of people from Hollywood and from the film industry here in Whitestone, uh, there was a small uh, film studio that opened up here called uh, Kinema Color Studios. And there was a laboratory that uh, would hand tint uh, silent films with uh, color. 
This was like the early form of color. Wow. Yep. Now that's that must have been labor intensive and painstakingly uh, sure a detailed you had to process. Do each, each cell of the frame, you know, of, of the frame, frame by frame by frame. You know, there could be you know thousands of frames. So that's that was one uh, uh, unique thing that I learned. Did, did anything ever famous happen in Whitestone? Any big events? Anything? Any documents signed? Uh, you know, or any uh, peace treaties, or you know, anything like sure. that? Sure. Well, I, I think that the, the one of the most famous things uh, of all um, would be when Francis Lewis's farmland uh, homestead, rather, was burned to the ground. Uh, Francis Lewis, as I mentioned, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and. Uh, he was also a uh, a British born subject, so when the British found out that a British subject had signed the declaration, uh, they considered it treason. so a warrant was put out for francis lewis 's arrest. but on the night that they came to get him and they anchored a warship right off of Whitestone Park, and then a few men in canoes came to the shoreline and then entered the grounds of his estate, of his homestead. Uh, but Francis Lewis was away on business that, that week. And they found nobody there but his wife and his children. So the British, uh, since they couldn't arrest Francis Lewis, they arrested his wife and made her take his place. And they put her in a solitary cell aboard, aboard a prison ship in New York Harbor where she was for almost five days. Uh, didn't drink, didn't eat, didn't do anything. And uh, so they they abducted the wife and they burnt the home and his library to the ground. And uh, that really, really put him into a huge financial bind. And then sure enough, uh, uh, there was kind of like a depression in the country and uh, after the Revolutionary War ended, and he had kind of been playing both sides of the coin. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And uh, he lost a lot of money. And Francis Lewis, who right before the start of the revolution uh, was the largest uh, uh, landholder in Whitestone, uh, died uh, virtually penniless. Did he have, where, where was the site of his home? Uh, well, the site of the home that was burnt down is believed to be, and it was confirmed by one other historian, and that is uh, the site of... Um, of the what's his name? Oh, the Charles S. Col- uh, Colden from uh, Colden Center at Queens College. Sure. Uh, Charles S. Colden was born uh, here in Whitestone. His family had lived in Whitestone for generations, and his home, which still stands to this very day, was built according to him on the very foundation of Francis Lewis's homestead. So, where where would that be physically today? That is just north of Third Avenue. As you uh, pass the park on your left, uh, then you get to the first driveway, and that's for those three private homes. And that's it's one of, it's the oldest of the three private homes on that property. Wow. See, uh, so so in a, in a way, Francis Lewis Boulevard really has nothing to do with Francis Lewis's home. No, it's uh, named after him, uh, just to honor him as a patriot from from the area. Uh, so when you, when you wrote the book about White Stone, what was the biggest surprise that you learned in the in the research process? Um, most amazing thing I learned, uh, I, I think, just aside from the railroad, uh, just you know how how everything looked, you know, because I had never really seen that many old photos of White Stone. Whatever I had seen was from the '60s and the '70s and had really not seen anything from the early 1900s, late 1800s. And, uh, you know, it's just it's, it's startling to see that, uh, you know, the place had, like, a different life, you know, before we ever, ever came along. Exactly. And I guess some of the pictures of my childhood are probably a lot different than the pictures of your childhood, <laughs> you know, because of, exactly. ch- of all the changes and stuff like that. Um, did... did I noticed that there's no high school in Whitestone, you know, in the public school system. So did everybody from Whitestone go to some other place? Like I went to Bayside High School. Is, is there no place for Whitestone residents to go to high school? Uh, no, I mean, they, they were supposed to, uh, they proposed the plan for a high school a few months ago. 
I don't know if you recall that. No, no, I'm talking about you know before 2000. Oh. You know, just you know, just historically. Uh, no, not not in the area. I don't think so. Wow. All right, cool. All right, is there anything else you want to share with us? Any tidbits or, or are we good? Uh, no, we're good. All right. I mean, uh, I'm trying I'm trying to think. I'll, I'll give you one last question. What was the center of the Whitestone town? Was it always the like that 14th Avenue where the post office is? That part? Yeah, it was always 150th Street. That was always the main, the main uh, section. Um, kind of like by Harpels. Yeah, uh, because basically the town started from Francis Lewis Park. And uh, by f- where Francis Lewis and the CYO is or was, and it never went west or east of that section, and then it just went south, uh, you know, from starting from there. So that's where, so 150th Street, 14th Avenue, and then 150th all the way down, as far down as you can go towards the dead end, that, that's all the original part of the town, the first, the earliest settled part. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing all that great information, especially about the Manitouk Indians. I oh, thought, that, sure, I thought yeah, that was really cool. It's very interesting. So maybe one day this recording will be in a museum somewhere and will be added to the famous list of Whitestone residents that preceded us. <laughs> very, very good. Very good. All right. I'm going to close off this segment of YouTube. For those people who hung in tough for the entire uh, FM broadcast and YouTube, thank you. We love your comments. Uh, you can contact us at TCB Radio. WCWP at yahoo.com. You can post a comment. Thanks for listening. We'll always have more cool stuff. And hopefully, if Jason has some future projects, we'll try to bring him back for something else. So for now, we'll see you soon. Jason, stay with us.